Chapter 13 Did the Virgin Mary live and die in Britain? What about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Once again we are faced with drama as exciting as it is intriguing. Offhand one feels tempted to ask the doubtful question, Is it true that the Virgin Mary finished her earthly travail in Britain? It seems almost incredible to give an affirmative answer. Circumstance rather than evidence would appear to be the contrary. Yet when one stops to think, one quickly realizes how little is generally known about her and how silent the scriptural record is concerning her existence following the crucifixion of Jesus. One can easily be forgiven for thinking it is too wonderful to be true, yet the information presented herein appears to provide sufficient evidence to discount any doubt. However, we are entitled to our own personal reservations. In this case, it could easily be one of those amazing examples in which truth is stranger than fiction. Documentary testimony, by no means British, informs us with conviction that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was an occupant of the castaway boat that arrived at Marseille with the others before mentioned. Other reports take up the story in Gaul that Mary was a member of the Josephian mission that arrived in Britain A.D. 36. Testimony will be advanced, giving a special valid reason for her being with Joseph, her uncle. Other writers take up the theme in Britain, referring to her presence at Avalon, Glastonbury, with Joseph, Mary Magdalene, the Bethany sisters, and others, as unconcernedly as though it were a common matter of fact that should be well understood by all. Her life, death, and final resting place is described with a nonchalance that is breathtaking. But we ask, did not Jesus entrust his mother with his dying breath to the care of his beloved disciple John? Yes, he did. The scriptural record tells that as Jesus hung on the cross, he tenderly committed his mother into John's safe keeping. John, accepting the charge, led Mary away from the tragic scene before her son expired. Scripture states, From that hour, that disciple took her to his own. End quote. John 19.27, quote, Eis ta idia, end quote, parentheses, idia is a possessive pronoun, the word home is not on the text, end parentheses. As we ponder the text, we can read it in a qualifying difference over what is commonly understood by general assumption. The point of importance in the text is the statement that John, quote, took her to his own, end quote. Most critics have defined the text to imply that John took her as his own, thereby meaning he took Mary to his own home to remain there under his care. This qualification does not stand up, even under a casual study. At that time, John, like all the followers of the way, was a hunted man. For many years to come, long after the death of Mary, he had no home. The intention, as stated in the text, seems quite plain. John took Mary to his own, his own were the intimate disciples of Jesus, of whom Joseph was the protecting shield, and the Bethany sisters whose home had been a common meeting place for Jesus and his disciples. There is a world of difference between entrusting the care of a person to his own and one requiring the care to be ever personal. The latter is restricted only to the individual. To his own implies a broader meaning, which recorded events corroborate, if it did not, it would indeed be strange that such an auspicious trust was not frequently mentioned by John in his writings during his extremely long lifetime. He died at the age of 101. The facts are that at no time does John ever refer to Mary, nor even in his report of that first greater Easter morning. The submission of his trust is strange, and lack of reference to her by John could only mean one thing. The beloved Mary was not with him. Jesus definitely entrusted his mother to the care of John, but the request did not mean she was to be always in John's personal care, as much as it meant that John would see her safely provided for. Given the circumstances, it seems quite reasonable to expect John to turn to Joseph of Arimathea for the necessary protection. We know how greatly his family responsibilities had increased from the time of the infamous trial. Since his lot was henceforth indubitably cast in with that of the apostles and disciples of Christ, there is every reason to believe that Joseph would continue his guardianship of the Nazarene family with a keen awareness. That all the faithful depended on the protection of Joseph while they remained at Jerusalem is well established. 
Therefore we can reasonably concur that John would entrust his charge to a safe keeping more secure than his own. In those turbulent days, with persecution rampant, none of the faithful could guarantee their future with any degree of assurance. At that time it is quite doubtful if John knew that his selected field of teaching at Ephesus would be less dangerous than the places in which other disciples were to labor. It must be remembered that despite the hatred borne towards him by the Sanhedrin and possibly dissatisfaction in the local Roman Senate, Joseph remained in a position too powerful for either to contend with. Up to the point of his banishment from Judea, A.D. 36, he continued to retain his official status as a legislative member of the Sanhedrin, a provincial Roman senator, and noblis decurio. So important was this office considered within the Roman Empire that Cicero remarked ironically, it was easier to become a senator of Rome than a decurio in Pompeii. Consequently, the intrepid Joseph could be the only choice. There are several early documents which bear this out. One reads, quote, St. John, while evangelizing Ephesus, made Joseph paranymphos, end quote. Magna Glastoniensis Tabula at Nayworth Castle, parentheses, paranymphos means to be, quote, the guardian, end quote, end parentheses. We read in pages 42 and 71 the statement that St. John and St. Joseph were alone called, quote, paranymphos, end quote, to the Blessed Virgin. The Cotton, M.S. Titus, also relates the same facts. British testimony is supplied by Capgrave. From this we can safely judge that, in the first place, Joseph was the protector of all the faithful band, and later he was officially appointed by St. John to be the guardian of Mary, in which case the mother of Jesus could ever be in his custody and go wherever he went until the end, which the records affirm. In the last account given of Mary in the New Testament, after the Ascension, we find her, quote, dwelling among the disciples, end quote, in Jerusalem. This would indicate that Mary lived among the families of the faithful, moving from one to the other as safety required. Undoubtedly, the watchful eyes of her uncle would know when a change should be made to safeguard her person. As we shall see in the stirring events that followed, Joseph, her paranymphos, was faithful to the end when he personally laid her to rest, as he had formerly done with the tortured body of Jesus. Capgrave, in Novo Legende Anglia, particularly informs us that John gave Mary into the trust of Joseph, under the peculiar title of being her bride's man, that he was present at her death as were other apostles and disciples who came at her bidding to be by her side as Mary breathed her last. Many are the places claimed for her resting place, particularly the one in more modern times by the Roman Catholic Church, at a spot near Jerusalem named the Chapel of Dormiton. For many years the priests have pointed out to visitors a ledge stating that that was where Mary's coimesis, falling asleep, took place. However, none of the places in the East have withstood the probe of investigation. None of the disciples mention her tomb. St. Jerome recording the sacred places of the East during the 4th century by special commission of the church at Rome makes no reference to the resting place of Mary, Joseph, or many others for no other reason than that he knew they were not interred in Judea or in Rome. We can be sure that Mary, of her own desire, would never have wished to be left all alone in the land that held for her nothing but danger and memories of stark tragedy. The only happiness left to her on earth was in being associated with those who had been near and dear to her beloved son. It is impossible to believe that Joseph, her uncle and guardian, would have left her alone in Judea at the mercy of the hateful Sanhedrin. Equally so, it is impossible to believe that the Sanhedrin, when it expelled all the faithful from Judea in the exodus of A.D. 36, would have allowed Mary to remain. Thus, it is only reasonable to believe that the bond of association that held Joseph with Mary and her family since the childhood of Jesus would be a natural continuance. It gives strength to the documentary evidence which definitely states that Mary remained with Joseph and lived out her life among her dearest friends. Only among them would one expect to find her. On the other hand, if Mary had wished for her remains to be taken back to Judea for burial, St. Jerome would have known and recorded the fact. He would never have overlooked the important memorial of one held in such affectionate memory, who years later was to become so glorified by the Roman Catholic Church as to almost overshadow the glory of her son Jesus. 
The Virgin Mary was deified by the Roman Catholic Church in A.D. 600. She was never deified by the British Church. Christ alone, from the beginning and to date, is the only deity of the Church. Further contradiction is given to the claim that Mary remained and died in Jerusalem in the Glastonbury tradition of, quote, Our Lady's Dowry, end quote, bequeathed to her by Jesus himself, the dowry being the little wattle temple Jesus built with his own hands at Avalon, Glastonbury, wherein he communed with the Father and which he dedicated to the affectionate memory of his mother, as did St. David when he erected the first stone church, A.D. 540, over the hallowed wattle temple of Christ, which he had encased in lead for preservation. These points are important to know because the dedications of churches to the Virgin Mary began during the 12th century, the memorial to Mary at Avalon being the only exception. It could only have been so for a very special reason, particularly since the British never officially deified Mary. It had to be for a specific record. Actually, there is far more substantial evidence to support the Marian residence and demise in Britain than there is to prove Jesus once dwelt on the sacred isle, and this in spite of the strength of opinion. Nevertheless, the antagonists of the Marian story base their denials on the premise that Jesus was never in Britain. In consequence, they claim he could not have erected the Waddle Temple for her dowry. How the critics can claim intelligence in reasoning to this conclusion is not understandable. The fact is, neither the absence or the presence of Jesus in Britain has a bearing on the subject. Mary's going to Britain with Joseph was a matter of valid circumstances. The atheistical mind jeers in its final challenge, quote, Why would Jesus go to Britain? Why should he go to a, why should he go to a barbarian country? End quote. The bigotry of the critic is always the same. They never provide an answer to substantiate their challenge. Never once have they attempted to fill in the 18-year gap in the life of Jesus from the age of 12 when he confronted the Pharisees in the temple to the age of 30 when he began his ministry. The destructive critic ever assumes that what he does not know about could not have happened. Their minds are cluttered with intellectual weeds. Let us dwell for a moment on those silent years of Jesus and see if we can rationalize the circumstances of his life to fit into this unique relationship in Britain, twixt mother and son. Jesus is frequently referred to as the carpenter of Nazareth. Being a carpenter, as the Bible infers he was, he must have served an apprenticeship, which likely began at an early age. Apprenticeships in Europe and Britain, well within the last 100 years, often began at the age of 14. How long he worked plying his trade is unknown, but we can safely assume that, being aware of his destiny, he must have abandoned his trade early in order to prepare himself for his great mission. This being the case, he would naturally be attracted to the foremost centers of religious wisdom of his day. One may rightfully inquire why he did not study under the rabbis of the Sanhedrin. Jesus provides the answer in the contemptuous manner in which he accused them, quote, of knowing not the law, end quote. The facts are readily conceived. The Pharisees were a sect founded by Pharez, who created the school of predestination. The Sadducees were founded by Sadoc, a disciple of Antigonus Scohaeus, known as the school of infidels. These are the fanatics who ruled the Sanhedrin of Jesus' day, those whom Jesus called whited sepulchres, full of dead men's bones. He could find no wisdom among them. Where he could find wisdom, there he would be certain to go. The Rig Vedas, the ancient religious books of India, were written 1500 BC, and the Druidic religion antedated that of India circa 1800 BC. The wise men of India record the visit of Jesus among them, stating that he dwelt at Nepal. They also make several references to Britain as a great center of religious learning. Therefore, on several scores, Jesus would know the eminence of Druidic religious wisdom. He would know from his uncle Joseph, who frequently visited Britain on his tin mining excursions. It was popular knowledge among the Greeks and Romans who heavily populated Judea. He would know from his association with the wise men of India, and, if tradition is true, he would know from personal contact with Britain made when his uncle Joseph took him on his seafaring trips to that country. Eastern and Western tradition claim Jesus completed his studies in Britain. This could be possible. 
At that time, the Druidic universities were the largest in the world, both in size and in attendance, with a listing of 60 large universities and an average attendance of over 60,000 students. Gildas, Catonian MS, also Morgan, History of Britain, pages 62 through 65. This is affirmed by Greek and Roman testimony, which states that the noble and wealthy of Rome and other nations sent their children to study law, science, and religion in Britain. One can well pause to grasp the fact that ancient Britain then had acquired a stature with institutions of learning and attendance rivaling that of modern USA in its principal universities. Consequently, one is not left in doubt as to why Jesus might have elected to have studied in Britain. That Jesus had been absent from Judea for more than an ordinary length of time is proven by the tax incident related in Matthew 17, 24. The tax collector accosts Jesus and Peter on their arrival at Capernaum and asks Peter if his master has paid his tax, indicating Jesus to be a stranger subject to tax. Actually, Jesus did not need to pay tax. Capernaum was his domicile to which the family of Jesus had moved from Nazareth early in his life. Jesus put up no argument advising Peter to pay the stranger tax, thereby inferring he had been absent for so long that he could be regarded as a stranger. By this act, Jesus admits an absence of years from his homeland. Tradition and written testimony assert that Jesus did abide in Britain and whilst there created a temple of loving testimony to his mother, this was, quote, Our Lady's Dowry, end quote, to which Joseph, the Paranymphos, bridesman, led her, and where she lived her life out in its sanctity. A wealth of ancient writers, ecclesiastical and secular, affirms it. For over a thousand years, it was commonly spoken of as the church built not by human art. St. Augustine, during his presence in Britain, was quite familiar with the facts and the existence at that time of this hallowed memorial. Of it he writes with delight and at great length to Pope Gregory in a letter still extant. He writes with devout acceptance, a part of which reads as follows from Epistolae ad Gregorium Papam, quote, in the western confines of Britain there is a certain royal island of large extent, surrounded by water, abounding in all the beauties of nature and necessaries of life. In it, the first neophytes of Catholic law, God beforehand acquainting them, found a church constructed by no human art, but divinely constructed, or by the hands of Christ himself, for the salvation of his people. The Almighty has made it manifest by many miracles and mysterious visitations that he continues to watch over it as sacred to himself and to Mary, the Mother of God, end quote. In this brief extract, St. Augustine assembles and declares all the salient facts. He identifies it as the royal island, Silurian, where the first disciples of Christ, declaring the Catholic law, universal law, not Roman, found a sacred temple built by the hands of Jesus and that it was held sacred to himself and the memory of Mary. This alone is trenchant testimony and written nearly 600 years after Joseph, Mary, and the Bethany group arrived in Britain. The hallowed sanctity of Our Lady's Dowry is descriptively corroborated by the Saxon historian William of Malmesbury, who wrote his outstanding works in the 12th century. He wrote two histories covering the religious subject matter related herein. His last work, De Antiquitate Glastonii, is most authentic. He was specially commissioned by the abbot of Glastonbury to write the complete history of the famous church from its beginning at Avalon and was invited to live at the abbey where he had full access to the world-famous Glastonbury Library. Therein were contained all the original documents from Druidic times, consequently he wrote his history with the benefit of first-hand material, long before the great fire completely destroyed the abbey and its wonderful library, then considered one of the largest in the world. Consequently, his historic literary work completed at the abbey, under his commission, is probably the most precious document of the British Christian Church in existence. There are other outstanding works on this subject one can refer to with profit, such as De Origine Ecclesiae Britannicae by Elvin of Avalon, an illustrious British scholar who had been educated in the school of Joseph of Arimathea at Avalon, A.D. 180, 
he is referred to by the eminent Roman Catholic ecclesiastic Pitsius and Cardinal Baronius, related history de Rebus Anglicus Act by Pitsius, Capgraves de Sancto Joseph at Arimathea, the Magna Tabula of Glastonbury at Hayworth Castle, Hearn's John of Glastonbury, Bede's Ecclesiastical History, Gilda's and Geoffrey of Monma, among others, particularly Glastonbury, the Mother of Saints, by the Reverend L. Smithett Lewis, Hewan's Royal Saints of Britain, Rees' Welsh Saints of Our Own Times. The most interesting reading in William of Malmesbury's great work as it concerns this story is where he recites the authentic, well-known story of St. David, A.D. 540, when he came to Glastonbury to rededicate the new church and his mind was changed by a dream. During the first night St. David slept at Glastonbury, the vision of Jesus appeared to him in a dream, telling David that rededication was unnecessary, saying, quote, He himself had long before dedicated the church in honor of his mother, and the sacrament ought not to be profaned by human repetition, end quote. St. David obeyed, and the original consecration to Mary stood. In order to perpetuate the historic beginnings of the church and that no mistake should be made at any future time as to its exact site, St. David, A.D. 546, erected a new stone addition to the old church over the grave of Mary and enclosed the original wattled church encased in lead. He caused a pillar to be erected on the site with a brass tablet bearing record to the fact. At the time of the dissolution, under the edict of Henry VIII, it was still standing. The edict robbed this ancient church, as well as many others, of its ancient privileges, and later, during the Puritan desecrations, the historic abbey fell into disrepair and decay. Fortunately, the brass tablet was recovered in an excellent state, in an excellent state of preservation, and, according to Archbishop Usher, 1639, it was treasured in the possession of Sir D. Thomas Hugo at Wells. Later, it came into the possession of Sir Henry Spellman, who describes it in his book Concilia. The tablet reads, quote, The first ground of God, the first ground of the saints in Britain, the rise and foundation of all religion in Britain, and the burial place of the saints, end quote. Dean Armitage Robinson excavated the base of the original pillar in 1921. Thus, the memorial erected by St. David is today preserved for all to see and to read. The Rev. Lionel Smith at Lewis, vicar of Glastonbury, was indefatigable in his research to prove the validity of Jesus and his mother Mary residing in Britain, and painstaking in disclosing the history of Glastonbury from its saintly beginnings at Avalon. In the spring of 1953, he wrote to the writer stating that in the past few years he had recovered much more authoritative information from rare old documents he had discovered concerning Jesus and Mary that would prove revelatory on the subject. Subject. His one wish then being that he would be privileged to publish this, his last and best work, before he died. He stated once and for all that he would prove the validity of the old traditions with incontestable evidence. Unfortunately, he died suddenly a week after writing to the writer at the age of 86. However, his widow and co-helper and curate, the Reverend Stacy, have carried out his last request. This is now published under the title St. Joseph of Arimathea at Glastonbury by James Clark and is available to purchase at Amazon or to borrow at openlibrary.org and may still be available from Covenant Books. This redoubtable researcher for the truth points out the unique place of honor occupied by the Virgin Mary in the Roman Catholic Church from earliest times to date and states, quote, No one better than they, the Roman Catholic Church, know the facts of her, Mary's, life, and no one better than they espouse them, and over the ages the holy ground at Glastonbury has been constantly referred to by them as, quote, Our Lady's Dowry, end quote. As such, it has always been recognized by the Roman Catholic Sisterhood, who never cease to pray daily for this hallowed spot at Glastonbury, Our Lady's Dowry, end quote. This was the spotless legacy Jesus left to his mother Mary, the inheritance bequeathed and built by his own hands and sanctified by his prayers. It was here that Joseph finally laid her to rest, A.D. 48, while the Claudian campaign was still raging in Britain four years before the historic events began to happen at Rome at the Palladium Britannicum. 
From the earliest times, ecclesiastical and secular chronicles substantiate the story long before the Roman Catholic Church was founded. It has been carried on through the ages, and apparently more particularly by the Roman Catholic Church to present times, as the Reverend Lewis relates above, not only in England, but also in France. E. Hutton, in his Highways and Byways in Wiltshire, states that it is so referred to in Italy at Assisi, an old English lady, Mrs. Cottrell of Penweris Cornwall, educated at a French convent in Alexandria, conducted by nuns who were members of the old French nobility, was taught that St. Joseph of Arimathea took the Blessed Virgin with him to Britain and that she died there. Why would this story persist through the ages if it were not true? The fact that modern Roman Catholics continue to espouse it is rather amazing under present circumstances. Why should they declare the historic facts and daily pray for her resting place at Glastonbury as, quote, Our Lady's Dowry, end quote, and at the same time show pilgrims and sightseers the stone ledge in the chapel at the Dormitron? Then, nearly two thousand years later, after, they decided her death to have been a physical translation so celebrated by the Roman Catholics throughout the world in declaring 1954 as the Marian year. To Christians other than Roman Catholics, this intense glorification of the Virgin Mary seems strange. It is so great in the South American countries that this continent is commonly named the Land of Mary. The Christian faith of the Celto-Anglo-Saxon Protestants remains firmly entrenched in its original fountainhead, Jesus Christ. The Virgin Mary is regarded as but an instrument in the divine purpose. There is no passage in the Bible that shows that Jesus regarded his mother as divine. On the occasion when his disciples told him that his mother and brethren were present, he asks, quote, Who is my mother? and gives the explanation. Naturally, he regarded her dearly, as proven by the dedication and heritage he bequeathed to her at Avalon, and, consequently, any evidence brought forth to substantiate her life and death in Britain is of prime importance to all Christians. When printing was invented, the first book to come off the press was the Bible, and then Vincen de Vorde printed the life story of St. Joseph. At the same time, Pinson printed two accounts of the Arimathean story, copying from old documents, one of which carried these interesting lines. Unfortunately, I've not found an old English audio translator, so rather than butcher this absolutely beautiful language, I'm going to have to approximate modern English pronunciation. Quote, now here Joseph came to England, but at that time it was called Britain. Then fifteen year with Our Lady, as I understand, Joseph waited still to serve her. He was fine. End quote. The intriguing feature of this verse is contained within the last two lines. The chronicler states that Joseph came to Britain, then clearly informs us that Mary was with him and that he cared for her for fifteen years. This length of time closely approximates the number of years Joseph was Mary's paranymphos, or bridesman, from A.D. 32 to A.D. 48. The old ecclesiastical records of Glastonbury, confirmed by many other ancient writers, state that the Virgin Mary departed this life in the year A.D. 48. Coinciding with this, the Abbey records officially declare that St. Mary's Chapel, erected by St. David, was built over her remains. Melchinus, a native Avalonia known as Maelgwyn, Celtic bard, historian and philosopher who lived circa A.D. 450, writes, quote, Ye ale church was built over the grave of the Blessed Mary. End quote. William of Malmesbury wrote in his Acts of the Kings of the English, Book 1, Chapter 2, quote, The church of which we are speaking, Glastonbury, from its antiquity called by the Angles by way of distinction, quote, Ailed Chiche, end quote, that is the quote, old church, end quote, of wattlework at first savored somewhat of heavenly sanctity even from its very foundation, and exhaled it over the whole country, claiming superior reverence, though the structure was mean. Men of that province had no oath more frequent or more sacred than to swear by the old church, fearing the swiftest vengeance on their perjury in this respect. In the meantime, it is clear that the depository of so many saints may be deservedly called an heavenly sanctuary upon earth, who there more especially chose to await the day of resurrection under the protection of the Mother of God." End quote. In these words, the writer shows the deep veneration in which St. Mary's Church of Glastonbury was held by all in the fact that they swore their most fervent oath by the old church, 
just as we today in court swear our oath on the Holy Bible. The plain meaning in the last passage is that the Blessed Mary was buried there. From the time of her death and for centuries after, we are constantly confronted with the desire of holy men and women, disciples, pilgrims, kings and princes from all parts of the world, who sought interment in the ancient cemetery at Glastonbury to, as phrased, quote, await the day of resurrection under the protection of the Mother of God, end quote. The list of recorded names still extant buried at Glastonbury is the most illustrious and unique, superior to any other cemetery in the world. This in itself is the greatest testimony to the sacred remains enclosed in that hallowed ground. This ground has always, from time immemorial, been called the most holiest ground on earth. The most hallowed spot in Christendom. The burial place of the saints. The mass of testimony supporting this historic incident appears to overwhelm any argument to the contrary. One finds it difficult to believe all this is but a prayerful tribute to a legend without substance. Where there is smoke, there is always fire. There are other historic facts to be considered to support this amazing record that can be seen to this day, irrefutable evidence. One of the most unique monuments that remain from the olden times is the ancient stone that silently stares down on the beholder from the standing outside wall of the Lady Chapel. It bears but two names, Jesus, Maria. This time and weather-worn tablet has puzzled scholars for centuries. Devoid of any other inscription, it has ever been recognized as a significant marking with a definite meaning. It is commonly asked, why was it put there? What does it mean? It has all the hallmarks of a very ancient piece of masonry preserved from the original stone church and replaced in the second new stone church after the disastrous fire of A.D. 1184. The late Rev. L. Smith at Lewis, vicar of Glastonbury, declared that the meaning of those two noble names is no riddle. St. Joseph of Arimathea at Glastonbury, page 59. It represents the signature of Jesus, naming the dowry he had provided for his mother Mary, truly an amazing document in stone, revealing for all time and to all peoples the ancient title to this hallowed spot at Avalon. Centuries before Avalon was renamed Glastonbury by the Saxons, two names were frequently found documented in the writings of the old scribes, definitely referring to something of great importance. Usually no explanation was given, indicating that titles and place were as commonly known to the people of those years as today. Confederation is known to Canadians and the Statue of Liberty to Americans. To the priesthood and historians of those enthralling years, the two names employed designating the particular place were Secretum Domini and Domus Dei. The first title means the secret of our Lord, and the second the house or home of God. The explanation given is that the little wattle temple was the house or home of God, because therein he dwelt, and the secret of the Lord was the dowry and dedication of the same to his mother. In substance, the ancient stone registers the record and site of, quote, Our Lady's Dowry. This is not myth, legend, or unsupported tradition. The title is officially recorded in the ancient names in the famous Doomsday Book, A.D. 1086, which reads as follows, quote, the Domus Day in the great monastery of Glastonbury called the Secret of Our Lord. This Glastonbury church possesses in its own vill Twelve hides of land which have never paid tax. End quote. Doomsday Survey Folio, page 249b. Not only is this particular evidence officially recorded in the historic Doomsday Book, it also corroborates the original deed of the Twelve Hides of Land, 1,920 acres, and its tax free grant as given to St. Joseph of Arimathea and his companions by the British Prince Arvirigus of the Royal Silurians when the Bethany Group first landed in Britain. It should be borne in mind that the date given above, AD 1086, is not the date in which the Doomsday Book was first written. It represents the date in which the Norman King William had all the historic events recorded within the ancient book rechecked and brought up to date to his reign as King of England. 
The original date and name of this great book is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, preserved in the British Museum. Parts of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle overlap the period of the Doomsday Book, the four manuscripts ending with the following dates A. 1001, B. 977, C. 1066, and D. 1079. The later Laud M.S. ends in 1154. Doomsday Book could be a continuation of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It was created by King Alfred the Great, A.D. 871, who commissioned monastic scholars to translate into the Saxon tongue the ancient British history from documentary evidence. The British historians Capgrave and Kemble both wrote that Alfred was given great credit in history for creating laws, institutions, and reform. What he did was to restore and enforce the ancient British practices of law, order, and religion in existence many centuries before his time. This was borne out by an old record in which it states that Alfred ordered the ancient laws of Dunwall to be codified into the Saxon tongue. Dunwall, or Dunwallen, was the greatest of early British kings and certainly the greatest lawmaker in British history. E. O. Gordon, Prehistoric London, pages 101 through 104. Morgan, History of Britain, pages 42 through 46. He is recorded as Dunwall, the lawmaker. He lived and reigned 500 B.C. However, one cannot help but be impressed by the act of William the Conqueror, Duke of Normandy, hostile to the Saxons by his claim to priority to the British crown in recognizing the validity of the record of this ancient church and causing the facts to remain perpetuated in the famous historic Doomsday Book. Not only this, but he openly declared his respect for the sacred abbey by endowing the church with another charter and his royal protection. Over fifty years before this act of William, another foreign invader, the Danish king Canute, had journeyed to Glastonbury Abbey, quote, with a great entourage, end quote, and knelt beside the tomb of the former British king, Edmund Ironside, whom he so greatly admired. The historic record is lavish in detail, telling us that the pilgrimage of the Danish king was conducted in splendor and with peacock feathers. He bestowed on the church munificent gifts and gave it to his enlarged charter, A.D. 1032. It is an astonishing fact to remember that, despite the bitter determination of the Roman Empire, to persecute and uproot and destroy everything that was Druidic and Christian in Britain, despite the pillaging and ravishing of monasteries, churches, and libraries by Roman, Saxon, Dane, and Norman, not once was the sanctity of the abbey defiled. Excepting the Romans, the leaders of the Saxons, Danes, and Normans held the old church in awed respect. Under pain of punishment, they forbade any of the soldiery to defile its sacred precincts or molest its occupants. Sad as it is to relate, what defilement this hallowed British institute was to suffer was done by its own countrymen and a royal descendant of the famed Christian warrior Arviragus, none other than King Henry VIII. This despotic monarch not only stole all its precious possessions, but robbed it of all its ancient privileges and brutally murdered the last abbot. Abbot Whiting was hung, his body quartered, and his head stuck on the spike of the church gate and his other parts stuck elsewhere, a dire threat to all who dared challenge the king's despotic will. The Puritans performed the final desecration. Strange as it may seem, when we consider the unbridled despoiling during the dissolution A.D. 1539 through 40 and the fanaticism of Cromwell's Puritans A.D. 1653 through 58, the ancient tablet escaped mutilation. No church in the world has been favored so many times by royal charters as Glastonbury Abbey. Each regal seal declared its sacred historic beginning attesting to the worldwide reverence held for the sacred memorial to Christ, each a magnificent testimonial to the great truth. We know that this ancient tablet bearing those two immortal names was hewn by the builders of the first stone church, replacing the one built by Joseph and his saintly companions. Five years before Mary died, she saw the shadow of the persecuting hand of Rome, which cast its baleful maw 
over the sacred Isle of Britain in the Claudian invasion of A.D. 43. This time, the Bethany family viewed the rising tide of Roman oppression from behind the fearless barricade of British Christian faith and valor. She saw the British army led by its British pentagons Guiderius, Caractacus, and Arviragus meet the Roman challenge with the greatest Christian crusading spirit in history, one that has never since been repeated. She heard the clarion call of the British archpriests exhort the people to rise in the defense of righteousness. Like the Levites of old, the British archpriests, according to ancient Druidic custom, marched in the front ranks of the soldiery without arms. On their white-shirted breasts, they wore the ancient sign of Aaron, the three golden rods, the insignia of the Trinity, meeting the foe with their deathless slogan, the truth against the world. They were, as even Julius Caesar had said of them a century before, careless of death. Tacitus, also Agricola 11, quote, The Britons, however not yet enfeebled by a long peace, are possessed of superior courage, end quote. In all probability, Mary saw the Christian mission rise at Avalon like a fruitful tree, with converts pouring in in an ever-rising wave, and saw them, as well as the original Bethany band that came with Joseph to Britain, stem out into other lands to preach the word, and in many cases, die the death of martyrs. At Avalon, she would frequently meet the Beloved in Christ as they convened with Joseph and his companions to plan their crusading campaigns to Christianize the Gentile world. What a glorious privilege was hers. It is interesting to know that the sacred burial spot that was to inter a multitude of holy men, kings, and martyrs has been called the British Vale of Jehoshaphat, quote, the Isle of Departed Spirits, end quote. Lewis, St. Joseph of Arimathea at Glastonbury, page 44, 6th edition. With all the mass of tradition and documentary evidence from Gaul, Brittany, Normandy, Spain, Italy, Constantinople, Rome, and Britain, and the great number of name places associating Mary and Jesus with Britain, one feels in his heart it is not possible for it all to be only a beautiful legend without foundation. How tenderly and lovingly the inspired British poet William Blake, 1757 to 1827, asks the appealing question in his magnificent poem, Jerusalem, so popularly sung in Christian communities. Jerusalem, and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among those dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. William Blake was born in London in 1757, but was familiar with the stories associated with Glastonbury and steeped in its ancient history. He expressed his heartfelt prayers for this, the holiest ground on earth, in his beautiful poem, which immediately became adopted as a hymn familiar to us all. This hymn was a great favorite of King George V, on special occasions of national significance, he would ask for it to be played and sung. He was familiar with the historic story. The Royal Library contains many ancient treasures, including the extraordinary genealogical chart showing the British royal line to be in direct descent from the royal kings of ancient Israel. <laughs> 